For March the 14th, we're continuing our Sunday morning series as we work our way towards Easter. The title of the series is Easter, the Gospel Message. I thought about calling it the Gospel and Easter Message because the two go hand in hand and are intertwined. Last time we looked at the idea that Jesus died for our sins. We're going to read again Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, follow with me as Paul defines for us what the gospel is. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which you have received and wherein you stand, by which you are also saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Notice what he said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That was last week's theme, that Christ died for our sins. And then notice in verse 4, and he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now this will not surprise you, but if you have a good commentary set or curriculum of some sort that you really like, and you go to 1 Corinthians 15 and you look up the commentary on that, or if you have a favorite preacher's uh, catalog of all the sermons they've ever preached. And you come to these passages, you'll find a lot of attention that Christ died for our sins because that's important. And you'll find a lot about him rising from the dead because that's significant. But most of them give almost an afterthought to the idea that he was buried. I would like to suggest for you a few reasons why I believe that his burial is very important. First, he was buried, and I think it's significant because it's proof that he was really dead. We don't bury people who are alive. Can I be real blunt with you? I, we, we see that the, every person involved with his crucifixion believed he was dead. And that's why he was buried. John 19, significant picture of this, beginning in verse 33, the Jews, therefore, when it was time of the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, For the Sabbath day was a high day. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. And there came the soldiers to break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. And they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already. They break not his legs. And one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. All of his blood was shed that day on the cross. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true. And he knoweth this is a true saying that you might believe. For these things were done that the scriptures would be fulfilled, not a bone should be broken. And again, another scripture said, they shall look upon him whom they've pierced. After that, uh, Joseph of Aramea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave, and therefore he took the body of Jesus. Leaders, enemies of the state, Soldiers, professional executioners, all said Jesus was dead. He was buried as a proof of his death. But he didn't just affirm that himself by dying. Notice what the centurion said in Mark 15. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, the honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went uh, boldly unto Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he were already dead and called in him the centurion and asked whether he'd been dead a while. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Can I remind you that at every step along the way, his death was pronounced. The centurion, the uh, officials with the state, the officials of the church, the Jewish leadership, his burial is proof that he died for our sins. He was indeed dead. It was proof. I think it's also important to understand that his burial is significant because of the prophecy. The Old Testament would tell us that Jesus would be buried, that it would fulfill the scripture that he declared, uh, Isaiah 53, 9, that, that he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death. He was buried in the borrowed tomb of a rich man. Joseph Arimathea was a a religious leader. He was an honorable counselor. He was a wealthy man. He had a brand new tomb that had never been used. Obviously, we don't recycle many tombs. And they laid Jesus' body in there. Friend, I want you to understand Jesus was dead. We have proof 
we have the prophecy being fulfilled. Uh, Matthew 27 says it this way, when he came, he got the body of Jesus and Pilate commanded the body be delivered. He wrapped it in fine linen cloth and laid it in that new tomb. But Jesus also prophesied it himself that he would die and be buried. Jesus spoke of his burial when he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper. You'll recall this story. A, a woman comes and anoints Jesus with an expensive box of perfume, and it upset so many there that day. Read with me, if you would, in Mark chapter 14, verses 6 through 9, that Jesus said to let her alone. Why trouble her? She's wrought a good work. For ye have the poor with me always, but whomsoever ye will uh, that may do good, but me you have not always. See, Jesus said we're always going to have poor. We should always minister to them. But this woman has ministered to me who she will not always have. And then Jesus said that she's done this aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. And then he said something phenomenal. Verily I say to you that whosoever, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she has done shall be spoken as a memorial for her. Jesus prophesied two things in that, didn't he? First off, I just told you that she took a very expensive box of perfume and anointed Jesus with it. And Jesus said anywhere the gospel was preached, we would talk about her and we're talking about her tonight. But he also prophesied his own burial in a very symbolic way with an incredibly expensive box of custom perfume. Anointing the body. Oh, we could have sold that perfume and fed hundreds of people. No. She's anointed me for burying. Jesus talked about his own burial. It's an important part of the gospel. But can I remind you not just the proof of his burial, the prophecy of his burial, but we see that his burial is a picture. Romans 6 tells us it's a picture of baptism. And, and if you're a Christian and you've never been baptized, if, if you've never publicly gone through the motions of identifying with Christ through believer's baptism, I didn't say you were sprinkled as a baby. I said you've made a decision to follow Christ and you've never been baptized. You are walking in disobedience. Jesus' burial is a picture of our baptism. Look at Romans 6. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism in the death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we should also in the likeness of his resurrection. Every baptism is a beautiful picture of the burial of Christ. Uh, we'll typically say buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Every baptism, your baptism, is a gospel picture of the death to self, the burial like Christ was buried, and being raised in that newness of life in the picture of his glorious resurrection. And I challenge you to make certain you've been baptized because it is a picture of the gospel. Jesus' burial, we have proof of his death, we have prophecy being fulfilled. We have the picture of baptism for you and me who claim Jesus. But fourthly, and I think very significantly, because he was buried, we have a promise. It's a victorious promise. We can have it too. In that Romans 5 passage, notice this. He says, for if you've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Oh, what a great promise. 1 Corinthians 15 concludes verses 54 and following with this. And when the this corruptible shall I put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But notice verse 57. But thanks be to God who's given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, I want to remind you that his burial is a promise. That if we'll be buried like Christ was buried, if we'll surrender our lives to his and, and bury the old man, bury the old self, bury the old way of life, we'll be risen in the likeness of his resurrection. 
And thanks be unto God who gives us the victory. There's a promise of victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel that Paul declared is that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, and he was seen of many. Today I want to ask you very honestly, have you been buried in the likeness of Christ? Have you pictured through your testimony the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus? Well, before you get baptized, you need to make a decision to follow him as your Savior, as your Redeemer. You must be born again. The gospel demands it. We embrace his death for our sins, his burial as proof he was dead, as fulfillment of prophecy, as a picture of our witness through baptism, and as a promise of future everlasting resurrected life. Do you know Jesus? Oh, I pray you do. If you have any questions about him, go to our website, fbc-sellersburg.org. And on our website, we have a link at the top that says, Need Hope, the Gospel. And there you can read the gospel of Jesus, how Jesus died for you and loves you and gave himself for you. And through repentance of sin, you can be made new. Or maybe you have questions about baptism. We would love to help you with that. Any way we can, we want to be a blessing. May God be the glory. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. There's no question that he died for my sin. He prophesied he would be buried. It's a beautiful picture of my baptism. And it's a great promise of resurrected life. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the Easter celebration. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you.